Good morning. The District Court of Appeal of the State of Florida in and for the Second District is now in session. The Honorable Patricia J. Kelly, Judge presiding. Those having business before this court, draw near, give attention, and you will be heard. May God save the United States of America, the State of Florida, and this Honorable Court. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today, today's session of the Second District Court of Appeal. Um, as you may know, each side is allotted 20 minutes for their argument. I will reserve a little bit of time for the appellant if you let me know what you'd like to have. Um, when your case is called, there'll be a slight delay as you're transitioned into the virtual courtroom. Um, and when your argument is finished, we ask that you leave and you can continue to watch online if you would like to watch the rest of the session. Um, <clears throat> Try to remember to unmute, and that goes for all of us as well. So I think we're ready to start today's docket. Our first case this morning is uh, Kaplan versus State. Good morning. May it please Good morning. I'm sorry to interrupt before you even get started. I, I wanted to ask you all how you'd like to handle this since these cases are virtually identical. Do you just want to do one uh, 20 minutes each argument or do you think you'll need a little more time than that? Your, Your Honor, that's what I was going to thank you for, for the opportunity. That's what I was going to address initially. I know the court's familiar with the briefs. It's the same argument twice. It all arises from the same action. Um, mm -hmm. I have absolutely no desire or need whatsoever to ask this court for the full 40 minutes across to uh, as, enter <laughs> as entertaining as I, if I thought it might be more effective. But um, <laughs> I, I honestly, of course, depending on the questions from the court and the courts met me, but I don't see the need to consume more than 20 total minutes um, okay. in, in arguing the issues that I would like to that I would like to address this morning. Are you agreeable, Ms. Knox? Absolutely. Okay, so that's what we'll do. So I'll give you 15, five for rebuttal, Mr. Upson. Please, Your Honor. Okay, all right, thank you. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you so much and, and, and may it please the court, Keith Upson for the Kaplans. Um, good morning. I'd like to go over the backdrop of these events a little bit before discussing some of the issues. Uh, ideally, I'd like to talk, I'd like to address briefly three, three of the issues, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> this all happened after midnight when Mrs. and Dr. Kaplan were in their own home. And the question of whether an officer can put hands on someone who is yelling and waggling their finger at them is essentially both Kaplan's defense. Both Kaplan's defense was that no, that doing so was outside the scope of Corporal Delgado's reasonable and lawful performance of his duties. Klein Heinz at that point had handcuffed Jonathan Kaplan and Corporal Delgado testified that Mrs. Kaplan was Not to yelling. interrupt you right off the bat, Ms. Repson, but on that first point you make, I know we're hearing these together, but for you to say that that's both of their defenses, address how for Dr. Kaplan, who came out of his house at a later time and observed what he observed, how that would somehow transfer to her defense regarding what happened to the officers. I'm... I'm likely misunderstanding your question, Your Honor, because okay, I your, your, state, your statement was that that's the defense for both of them, that she's wagging her, whatever the, the beginning of the event was. How does that transfer to him who came out of the house at a later time? Well, and that, that's what I thought you were going to ask. And then I got confused because I thought you were asking, how does she avail herself of what he observed? And that, that's what no. I, I, it's our position, Your Honor. And I apologize to the extent this was not better briefed, um, which was a question I, I 
came across in preparation for argument. I, I think it is still on the page, though. I, if I could rewrite it, I would rewrite it now more clearly. I don't think the law requires, I think it simply requires that Delgado be lawfully performing within the scope of his duties. I don't think Dr. Kaplan had to have knowledge of that one way or the other. So it would be reasonable for you to ask as a follow-up, what if the facts revealed that she pulled a knife or, or some other egregious conduct? Well, then Delgado would not have been acting beyond the scope. And Dr. Kaplan's assumption when he came out of the home at midnight and saw someone on his wife would have been factually incorrect and he would not be able to avail himself of it. But under these circumstances, so, so I can think of a litany of other factual scenarios that aren't present where Dr. Kaplan would not be able to take the position that he has taken at the trial court or on appeal. It, it wasn't a trap house. I mean, it was, it was his wife. It was after midnight, some commotion gets him well, up. It, Mr. Opson, I guess, I, I, I'm trying to think how I want to phrase this question because uh, I don't want to sound facetious. Um, so, I'm not sure that I see, wasn't this a question for the jury, whether he was outside of the scope of his legal duties? Let's say, let's say your characterization is exactly how it occurred. Didn't the jury have an opportunity to decide whether or not he, the officer acted appropriately You're, in his dealings with the Kaplan's? Your Honor, but for the eight issues, particularly the first, particularly the first three, that that clearly, Your Honor, would be a jury question. P particularly the first three issues briefed on appeal, which it's our position. Position each, every one of those individually denied both Kaplan's their due process right to to defend themselves in front of the jury, and having been denied that right what we have is an unreliable outcome. If they could have tried their case and come to the same disposition. Well, I, I guess I'm not really clear completely on your argument about how they were deprived of their defense. Um, I understand, you know, Ms. Kaplan couldn't testify about an in, I can't remember what injury she had. And then Mr. Kaplan couldn't testify about his, or broken nose. She couldn't say broken nose. And he couldn't say I lost my hearing or my hearing was impaired. I understand that. But um, I, I'm not sure how that eviscerates their, their defense of, of we were acting in defense of ourselves or others. Or more particularly, Your Honor, that the officer was out acting outside the scope of reasonable awful execution. Well, did the, ju the jury saw those pictures of the, you know, their injuries, correct? They, they did, but Your Honor, that still turns on, I mean, to go back to my hypothetical, I hope I don't regret about, had there been testimony, she had pulled a knife. Had there been testimony, she had pulled a knife on the officer, I don't think anyone would bat an eye at the, at the injuries that resulted. The testimony, however, was that she was yelling and waving his finger in his face, and he lost his composure. And, and I think that that was... You know, I think that all that testimony came out and the jury could make a conclusion from that, regardless the, of whether she had a broken nose or he had impaired hearing. Well, and the, the harm, Your Honor, and, and I don't think what I'm about to tell the court um, is new or novel or deviates from what's already on the page as to our first three issues. But, but the state took this tangent where effectively they put Jonathan Kaplan on trial. None of the issues we've talked about so far this morning sway me or give me pause to back away from the position that there is no such thing as a, we don't have to disclose rebuttal witnesses, but that's just not. Right. And right. this record is remarkably similar to the facts as contained in this court's decision. In okay, will, you, will you articulate for me how the defense strategy would have been different had they known 
<clears throat> that a deputy, as opposed to the other officer that were involved in this altercation, was going to testify that uh, Jonathan was really intoxicated. Your Your Honor, it was it was never relevant. It was never relevant. No, no, I asked. I think I, part of the, the what we have to consider is whether or not that would have changed the defense strategy. Isn't that correct? It it is, Your Honor. Notwithstanding the fact that this court was unambiguous in Potts when it said, having been brought to the court's attention, um, the trial and this is quoting from 446 of Potts, the trial court was of the opinion the state need not disclose dis, to disclose rebuttal witnesses, which is I think clearly supported by this record as well. The objection was overruled without any inquiry, and here there was no inquiry. But to finally answer the question that you asked, Your Honor, and I'm glad you asked it, because I'm going to use Mr. Gregoza's own word. I'm going to use defense counsel's own words. From and you quoted him in your brief, and I've read the transcript, but go ahead. I have never deposed this witness. Now, I know they're going to do this in rebuttal, but you know, they could have deposed Jonathan. He was listed. They did not. I shouldn't be put in a position where now they're going to bring in a witness that I've never, I don't even know who it is. So notwithstanding the fact that the court didn't conduct the inquiry, counsel contemporaneously not only objected, but was articulating to the court. And I don't think this is, I appreciate this. The, the, so the change it. in strategy would have been he would have deposed this deputy? I, he articulated to the court. He that's what he said, right. I would have he, deposed this deputy. But that's not have, a strategy, is it? That's I, not altering his defense. Your, your Honor, without the benefit of deposing the non-disclosed witnesses, I, I think the point is we can't say. I don't think the burden on the defense is quite as high as the, as the well, court. Let's go, let's go back to, I want to make sure I understand actually what the defenses were for the Kaplans. They were arguing justifiable use of force, correct, was their defense? They, they were doing it from the side that the officer was not acting reasonably, did not use reasonable force, and therefore was acting outside of the scope of his official duties. Well, now that could go, that, does that go to an element of battery? I, I believe it does, Your Honor. I believe on these facts, where there was no testimony from Delgado, that he gave her directives, go back in the house, go away, stop. I don't recall any testimony that there were any law enforcement related actions that led up to the point that he first knocked her hand, batted her hand out of his face. He was annoyed and he touched her first and she brought the hand back. Yeah. And, he and I misspoke. Her. I'm sorry. I meant, did it go to the resisting charge instead of the battery charge, an element of the resisting, I, whether he was lawfully within the scope of his duty? Well, and, and, and candidly, and, and not to make light of the misdemeanors, but it's really the felonies. Yeah, no, I understand. And, and, and not to make light of the fact that Mrs. Kaplan still owes some county time to the trial court. It's really Dr. Kaplan's medical. It's the impact on Dr. Kaplan's medical license. Right. No, I understand. I understand. But he's still, he's still, well, uh, yeah, go ahead. The record doesn't, I can't, I can't I say. Just, I am just not completely clear on how these issues impact their ability to fully present their defense that they acted in self-defense. We, your Honor, so help help me with that, please. And I, I know you're to, trying. <laughs> well, and it'd be great if I could be more dy dynamic and actually jump to the third issue, which I've said I think the okay. first three. I really want to keep talking about the first two. And well, let's it, talk. But, let's let's talk about the third one then. But but I, I'm. So I apologize to the court for making that so difficult for you to get me there, but there's just no reason whatsoever why he couldn't use the word battery in closing, none. Much less the preemptive ruling 
And I, you know, I mean, kudos, I guess, to the state for knowing their judge. Um, and God bless the, or I appreciate the trial court giving us sufficient record of the reasoning behind it. It just doesn't hold up. In the answer, the attorney general has said it would have been a confusing or misleading statement of law. And then helpfully points out that officers are allowed to use any force which the officer reasonably believes to be reasonably believes to be necessary to defend himself or herself or another from bodily harm. This record doesn't support any suggestion that anyone was subject to any kind of harm. She was yelling at him. It's annoying. He didn't even testify, as I recall, that she was yelling threats at him. I'm going to hurt you. Not, nothing to that effect. She was waving, the grandmother was waving her finger. So and the all, jury, the jury heard that and they heard the testimony that that he grabbed her arm, pushed her to the ground, pushed her face into the concrete. They heard all of that. But they the the, the reasons the court gave for not allowing him to use the word battery is because it has particular legal significance. And that was the whole point. And it was a battery. Okay. And it's closing. Like I briefed, he could have used the word battery and even if it were more tenuous than it actually was, free reign. Not entirely free, but you just can't cuff the defense theory of the of the defense. No, 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 you can't use the word battery. That has particular legal. Yeah, I know it does. It was he touched her first. He lost his cool. He didn't control the situation. He was batting her hand out of the way. She pulled away, which is a human reflex. He grabbed her arm and he escorted her to the ground because he couldn't control the situation. And when law enforcement can't control the situation, people get hurt and people did get hurt. Okay, so so you're you, you focused now for a while on her. I'm glad you said you brought the obvious, which was in the briefs, that this is really about Dr. Kaplan's license and his felony charge. So take that same discussion one step further as to Dr. Kaplan, uh, because that's where I'm having some some difficulty here. We just focus on his case. He comes out of the house. He thinks he knows what he sees or didn't see. He, he knows that this is his wife of many, many years, but an officer then gets uh, battered and he, he approaches the officer because he thinks that his wife's in the right and the officer's in the wrong. Discuss how, I mean, the jury heard all of this. They decided that all of the elements were there. I don't understand what you're, how this whole discussion applies to Dr. Kaplan. The, the shortest way, Your Honor, I think I can respond to that that's not already contained in the briefs. I think he was right. I think he came out of his home to another human beating his wife, and he did what was reasonable. Well, and it will stop that. That's, you know, that was told the jury for them to decide was that what it was actually going on, whether it was or it wasn't. But the problem I have with it is what you just said, okay, because he was right. If we as society are going to let that as a defense, anytime someone comes across law enforcement fulfilling what they think is a lawful duty, I think clearly she is affected by it if they were wrong. But for him or any other citizen, <clears throat> short of, uh, you know, there being uh, a, an officer just pummeling somebody after they're passed out or whatever's happened when it goes that far, for him to just insert himself into the situation, I don't see how what began the conflict somehow transfers to him. Well, and I, I appreciate that because I, I didn't brief, well, he was right, so let's get to the outcome 
But can, just can, Mr. Upson, finish answering this question, and then your time is up until rebuttal. So just go ahead and finish answering. I just want to let you know. All right, thank thank you, Your Honor. But but legally, the 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 crux is that point in time, notwithstanding the fact that Dr. Kaplan wasn't present for it or didn't know at the time that Delgado first put his hand and committed a battery on his wife. I think that absolves lawfully everything that follows. I appreciate so anyone and everyone. I mean, your, your theory of the case is that anyone and everyone that came upon that situation based upon how it started, it gives them the legal right to batter an officer or to insert themselves in the situation because the officer started, even if they didn't see it, because the officer started it in an incorrect manner. Not, not, not at all, Your Honor. I, I have this individual and these facts, and I have a record. But how does that not transfer? I mean, just because that was his spouse of many years, and he sees her being pummeled, what if it was a neighbor or anyone else? From a legal theory, why would that not transfer over? Well, and I, I'm not asking the court to write as broadly an opinion. Um, someone along the way, if, if the court writes the opinion I'm asking the court to write, someone then, like me, will come along and ask the court to expand that some more. Um, and I'm trying really hard to not go way off the page in the current climate of um, police stops that turn deadly and how many lives might be able to have been saved. Okay, I'm gonna have to stop you there. And you'll, you'll still get some time for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Knox, would you do me a favor? Would yeah. you please would you please pronounce your full name for me? Because I'm uh, afraid to say it and get it wrong. It's okay, Benoit Knox. Thank you, I appreciate that. And um, Mr. Optin, because the question's got a little more than 20 minutes, if you need more, I'll give you a little more. If you don't, feel free to wrap up whenever. <laughs> And go and you may start whenever you're ready. May it please the court counsel. Um, I think it's important. I'm, I'm going to start with the first issue, the Richardson issue. I think it's important there to, to think about what it is exactly that we're arguing about. And there's three points I really want to make about this issue. First, the witness that we're arguing about, Katina Henderson, the information she offered were about another witness. She impeached Jonathan Kaplan, not the Kaplans themselves. It was about Jonathan Kaplan. Second, what we're really arguing about is Jonathan Kaplan agreed that he had a few drinks and denied he was very intoxicated. What we're really arguing about is how intoxicated he is. We know he's been drinking, that's a concession, we're just arguing about how drunk he really was. And then third, I think as Judge Kelly touched on, that testimony that he was very intoxicated was expected by the defense because Corporal Kleinheinz and Delgado also testified that he was very intoxicated. So there's just no reasonable possibility that the defense was um, prejudiced, material prejudice in how they prepared for that trial. As to the next issues about the injuries, um, I just want to fill in the gaps of what was said before. Mrs. Kaplan wanted to testify that she had a broken nose. The actual medical diagnosis was that she had a possible tiny fracture without nasal injury. So possibly she had a tiny fracture, possibly she did not. So that was one of the problems. But moving on to um, whether the point that she basically took a beating, whether that came across to the jury. I noted down, I went through the record and I noted down everything that was testified to. He slammed her on the ground, slammed her head into the pavement. She was dazed, her face was swollen. Officer Delgado was on top of her and was slamming her head into the ground. He smashed at her face. He grabbed her head and pushed her. Her eye was swollen shut. It hurt tremendously. It was black and blue. Her, and she even said that her nose hit the ground and she hasn't been able to breathe normally since. So the magnitude of the injuries were well before the jury to consider. 
And I really struggled to see how her saying that she had, or the jury hearing that she had a possible tiny fracture would have had uh, more impact than what they actually heard. As to Mr. Kaplan, um, I think the issue here is maybe a little bit different because there's no, as to Mrs. Kaplan, there was a factual dispute. Did Officer Delgado smash her face into the ground or did he not? As to Mr. Kaplan, there's no dispute that he was punched. He agrees he was punched in the face one time. The reason he was punched is because he was bear hugging the leg of the officer trying to pull him down. The officer agrees he punched him. The doctor agrees he got punched. And so whether that punch resulted in an injury or not is really not material because that if the jury believes that punch was justified by the fact that he was pulling on the officer, it's almost like a, like a reversed eggshell doctrine kind of thing. Like the fact that it resulted into that, it resulted into that. But I think it just, it makes sense that he got punched when he's trying to pull an officer. And so, um, and so the state's position is that really did not change anything to the theory of defense, did not prevent them from putting forth their defense and there's no reversible error there. Can I ask you a question before you leave the uh, the, the uh, witness uh, issue? Sure. Was there a motion to continue or a motion for a recess so they could depose this witness? There was nothing, Your Honor. There, there, there was really, nothing argued. There so, was nothing argued, and it actually came up first before lunch break. So there was a lunch break in between, and at that point, defense counsel said, something like, all right, I understand she's a rebuttal witness. It's clear from the record that defense counsel thought, along with the judge, everybody was under the impression that a rebuttal witness does not have to be disclosed. And so the argument, there's a better argument from defense counsel that comes after lunch, but there is no motion to continue. There's no nothing, no motion for mistrial. There's no asking for a recess. Again, I believe because defense counsel was under the impression that that was allowable. Um, if I can move on to the, the word battery issue in closing argument, I think that's the same thing. Um, first, defense counsel, when the state brings it up, which is like akin to emotion in limine, this is not something abnormal. Attorneys do say, hey, I think the other side's gonna say that and they shouldn't be allowed to. That's nothing abnormal about that. And when the state does, defense counsel's answer first is, well, I don't know that I was going to do that. So I'm not really sure how we get to reversible error for something defense counsel wasn't even sure he wanted to do, be that as it may, the, he was able to use all the other words. He hit her, he shouldn't have, it was unjustified, he was the original aggressor, he initiated, he should have kept his cool, which again, the, the assumption that the reason Officer Delgado touched Mrs. Kaplan is because he couldn't keep his cool, that's the defense theory. Um, in reality, that's when she's committing the crime of obstruction and he's trying to make her stop it. He is pushing back on her, stop, stop, get away from me. And she's not getting the message and she pushes him. But in either case, all of this was well in front of the jury and um, the state was submitted that there is, there's no reason, there is no error or none that would require reversal in this case. If there are no further questions, um, the state would rely on the merit of its briefs. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Upson, rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, counsel objected to the non-disclosed witness, and I, I think the burden under Potts was satisfied. Counsel didn't ask to depose the witness. Counsel, counsel got enough on the record. The burden was on the court at that point. Um, a bigger problem, I think, is absolutely none of that was relevant whatsoever. I just, I don't see how anyone on the face of the earth thinks how drunk Jonathan Kaplan was 
on that night had anything to do with any of the charges brought against his mom and dad. Um, interestingly about Dr. Kaplan's injury, on appeal and an argument, the state seems to be making relevance argument, but relevance was never the state's objection below. The state's objection was they never told us so we can't rebut it, which causes the litany of problems that are already briefed that I, that I don't need to, I, failure to disclose simply isn't ever a factor in a criminal context. Well, I think they were arguing about, didn't have all the medical records and, and then they were arguing about causation and uh, but, they didn't have the, you know, and I can't remember what the other argument was, but I think you're right. I don't remember relevance in there, well, but they might've, but that's, you know, that's kind of neither here nor there because I'm not quite sure how I could, how the extent of his injury was central to his defense. You, Your Honor, I think it was this this straight. I think it deserved, and we'll never know. I think it deserved this level of attention at trial. I think Dr. Kaplan 100% could testify. Before I got punched in the face, I had no hearing issues. And after I got punched in the face, I have hearing issues. And, and that was it. And I think it speaks to the fact that, not to keep repeating the same phrases over and over, but that when Delgado initially touched Mrs. Kaplan, he had lost control of himself. And I think that, that that was laid out for the jury. So I, again, I come back to, I'm not quibbling with you about whether Mr. Kaplan could have said before this, I heard fine. And now I don't. Well, but when, what when, I'm concerned with is the impact of his inability to say that on proving his defense. Well, in your honor, I'm, I appreciate you setting that up for me because it kind of reels me back to big picture and then I'll stop. Okay. There was a lot here for the state to work with. Mm -hmm. And to my recollection, they largely got to do so. There was a lot more here for the defense to work with than they were allowed to. And that concerns me. The outcome might have been the same. I'm not arguing each of the errors are harmless. I'm not arguing anything like that at all. My concern is we don't know. Had the jury gotten the trial, the defense was entitled under the rules and the statutes to present and the constitution because the whole duty to disclose thing still makes my head hurt. Had the defendants gotten the benefit then we would all have some indicia in the reliability of the outcome. And that's what concerns me most about, about this. And I was really hoping counsel was going to talk about the state's closing and that issue, but uh, counsel didn't. So because I didn't address it before, now there's nothing for me to rebut. I'm a big fan of the briefs I wrote and filed and other courts read them and I, I appreciate the court's time and attention. Yeah, this, this case was well briefed by both sides and, and thank you both. Thank you very much, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next case this morning is Tanasia versus, I'm probably gonna screw this one up too, uh, Sariaya. Okay. Good morning. You want to pronounce the party's names for me, please? Mr. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Matt Coniglier on behalf of the appellant, Mr. Tanasia. Tanasia. The, ap the appellee is Dr. Soraya. Soraya. Okay. I made that a lot harder than it was. I think I added a syllable. And my apologies for that. And Mr. Coniglier, you can start when you're ready. Thank you. May it please the court. My name is Matt Canigliero. I'm with Carlton Fields, and I'm here today on behalf of the appellant, as we said, Mr. Tanasia. If I could reserve four minutes for rebuttal. All right. I'd like to start just with a really quick 
big picture mention of, of sort of what's going on here. We've appealed uh, really the, the either the dismissal or the grant of summary judgment on four claims in the fourth amended complaint. One of them, count four, was the fraudulent inducement claim. It concerns an option agreement and it's really sort of distinct from the other three. The other three that are at issue are count two, which was a breach of fiduciary duty claim limited to uh, the lack of consent for some transactions that happened. And then there were two other counts, count six, which was a constructive fraud count, uh, which involves breach of fiduciary duty as well, but it was more broad than count two. And then count seven, which was an intentional breach of fiduciary duty count, along with a breach of contract count. So just having painted that picture a little bit, um, I'm, I'd like to, I guess, if I have the opportunity, just begin with count four. It's brief last in the briefing, but in preparing for the argument, it seemed to me it maybe the most useful way to tackle these four was to address that one first and hopefully a bit quickly, and then spend the rest of my time on the other three counts. So beginning with count four, it was a count for fraudulent inducement. The trial court granted summary judgment on it uh, based on the provision in what's referred to as an indemnification agreement that was signed three weeks after the parties all entered the, the main underlying agreements. That argument is, is not really embraced much in the answer brief. The answer brief has a series of other arguments that are raised instead. Um, and I wanna to try to quickly talk about them. They've argued that there was no duty to disclose. As we point out in the reply, first, that's not the issue the judge ruled on. Second, that wasn't even raised in the opposition uh, or in the motion for summary judgment, I'm sorry. And had it been raised, we would have addressed it in detail. There was reference to duty there, but it was an argument that there wasn't a duty under the, the permitted transfers provision of, the, of one of the agreements. And so in the end, if, if duty to disclose were an issue, and it shouldn't be here, but if it were, the, the simple answer would be that Florida law is clear that even in an arm's length transaction, when parties begin to speak to each other, they have a duty to disclose all material facts. Here, Dr. Soraya left out the option agreement he had entered with the Lawanis. And that was a significant matter, especially to Mr. Tanasia. Uh, it, it, it may help to mention at the outset of all this, I don't think it would be missed by the court. All of the individuals who are involved here are, are part of a community and they had social relationships. Some of them had business relationships. Trust is a major factor here. And the simple truth was what Dr. Soraya did in going behind Mr. Tanasia's back with that option agreement was a, a, a violation of the trust that then existed. And had that been disclosed, really none of this would have happened, or at least there would have been a different deal that had been reached. Uh, also, the answer brief argues a series of other things that are really fact issues, such as materiality or reliance. And then there's an issue about the statute of limitations. Again, all things the trial court did not rule on in granting summary judgment. The limitations argument basically says that because Mr. Tanasia knew that a transfer had happened um, afterwards, back in 2007 or so, that that triggered the running of the statute of limitations. As we point out in the briefs, and as I'm sure the trial court understood, that doesn't hold water. It, we didn't know. There's no argument that Mr. Tanasia knew about the option agreement, which is the really the, the non-disclosure here, the fraudulent inducement. In a nutshell, those are the arguments regarding the fraudulent inducement count. The summary judgment on that count should be reversed. It, it was entered on an improper basis and, and counsel admirably tries to, to find other reasons to support it and none of them in the end hold up. I'll turn now to the other three counts, which are all centered somewhere around breach of fiduciary duty. And I'll begin with the, the first count addressed in the briefing, which is count six. Count six was a constructive fraud count. The trial court dismissed it on a ground that wasn't raised in the motion to dismiss. The trial court dismissed it for failure to state a claim because the court misread the claim. The court was looking for non-disclosures and didn't appreciate that it was a constructive fraud claim based on a breach of fiduciary duty by Soraya. And uh, and so the, the trial court's rationale isn't even defended in the answer brief. So when the court begins to analyze court count six, the, the only real question is, is there a, another basis in the record to affirm 
a dismissal of, of count six? And, and the answer is no, there isn't. Uh, Soraya argues really two things. First, a collateral estoppel argument uh, based on a summary judgment that was entered on a count we have not appealed, which is count nine. And then second, this derivative direct distinction. I'll begin first with the collateral estoppel argument. And, and collateral estoppel really comes in two flavors over the course of the briefing here. Uh, this is the first flavor. The first flavor is that because we didn't appeal the summary judgment on count nine, we're somehow precluded from, from raising error in count six. That just doesn't work legally or factually here. Count nine, the trial court read it as uh, dealing with leases or the lease that was on the property, the real property, and that it was at too low of a rate below market and all the claims related to that. The court allowed that claim to go forward uh, against uh, Soraya based on a, a supposed breach of the, the subordination and standstill agreements. Soraya moved for summary judgment saying, I wasn't a party to those agreements. And not surprisingly, he got summary judgment on that basis. None of that has anything to do with what's going on in count six with respect to Dr. Soraya. Uh, so the collateral estoppel argument does not work. And then we turn to the, the direct versus derivative arguments. Uh, this is a little bit of an unusual case in that there were only two members in this uh, limited liability company, and one of them was the manager. And, and, and the events at issue are fairly extraordinary in what happened. And, and this claim alleges both direct harms and special injuries. And there's no dispute that within the case law, um, a claim can be direct if uh, you have direct harm and, and special injury or if you have a, a statute or a contract that allows you a, a right to sue. Here, the, the case law is clear that a manager owes statutory duties uh, to members of an LLC. And the, the operating agreement that's at issue, the contract here that included uh, language about when the managing member could make these certain extraordinary decisions, has an express provision in it. And I, I wish in the reply brief, I just quoted the whole thing. Uh, I would direct the court to page 2295 of the record. The exculpation clause states, the manager shall not be liable to any member for good faith actions or failures to act. This is all concerning the unanimous consent provision. Then the next sentence says, such persons shall be liable for their gross negligence or for their own willful misconduct in the performance of their obligations under this agreement. That language is crystal clear that there could be a contractual claim bought. So all this, dis and the trial court understood that, at least at one point in this case, uh, in, in referencing the, the contract as a basis why the claims here were, were direct and not derivative. So for all of those reasons, count six should not have been uh, dismissed for failure to state a claim. And, and there isn't an alternative sort of tipsy coachman basis to do so. At this point, I want to speak for, for just a moment about what's going on with these fiduciary duty claims. Uh, a few different things are really at issue. One is that Soraya violated the operating agreement by not getting unanimous consent for these extraordinary actions that took place in 2012 with this grand settlement. That's one. If we didn't have that provision in the agreement for unanimous consent, there would still be a breach of fiduciary claim, uh, fiduciary duty claim on the same actions because what he did was still so extraordinary, it was arguably a breach of fiduciary duty. That's an easy argument for us to make. And then beyond that, beyond the, the breach of fiduciary duty with regard to um, disposing of, of, of downtown St. Pete properties assets, beyond uh, the lack of unanimous consent, there was still the set of events that occurred in that grand settlement in 2012 that were beyond extraordinary and extraordinarily harmful to Mr. Tanasia's interest. The managing member of downtown St. Pete Properties, wearing that hat, entered an agreement with the bank and with a company that Soraya created, that's uh, FSFA, and with really with others, but, but those were the, the, the principal folks, to do extraordinary things. They, they agreed to sell, well, basically to give away the assets of the company to the bank. Discuss that for a second. I mean, if, 
I read throughout your brief where you're talking about the giveaway of, of this, but they had pledged this asset, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So under what circumstance would a manager of the LLC be able to keep that asset? How, how is he going to keep it? I mean, other than maybe for some limited period of time, there was already litigation starting. So just uh, expound on that a little bit as to I, I how your theory would allow them to have kept this asset and done something with it if it was 100% pledged to someone else. So I then he, you. so that he used that. And I guess your argument is that that parlayed into a benefit for him. These are, it, it, argument in the end is very simple that this was one grand settlement and it involved many parts. Had the only thing that happened was that the assets of the company were turned over. Had that been the only thing that happened, this would be arguably a very different case. But it's not the only thing that happened. These all happened together. FSFA was created. Uh, Soraya arranged for this transfer to the bank and then for the bank to transfer uh, those assets to FSFA. There were the agreements with Ibed and with Paragon, which got uh, Dr. Soraya off the hook. They released the standstill agreements that were protecting Soraya and Tanasia from execution on those other loans, the, the Abed loan and the Paragon loan. And Soraya got kickbacks from the amounts that would be recovered by Abed and Paragon. Those are personal kickbacks. It's hard to picture sort of a grander right. breach of trust and fiduciary duty for a manager than what happened in this package. And so respectfully, Your Honor, it would be incorrect to simply isolate the, the documents and then being given away. This has to be looked at as a package. And it was a package. That's what happened. It was a grand- I was only settlement. responding to you. I mean, you said the, they got rid of the assets and that basically was the asset, correct? The, at that the, point- The that loan was... documents concerning the $4.8 million loan. Yes, Your Honor. Yeah. Okay. And, and so these things can't be sliced up in isolation. It was a package. And if we only focused on the, the Abed and Paragon deals, which were the basically, uh, not only was it self-serving for Soraya, but it was incredibly damaging for Mr. Tanasia because wearing his hat as manager of downtown St. Pete properties, Soraya released the standstill agreements. That was part of the package. And so that now those, lo those lawsuits went forward against Mr. Tanasia. I mean, that's in the end, an extraordinary set of circumstances. It absolutely amounts to a breach of fiduciary duty. And remember count six went out on failure to state a claim uh, for not having language about concealing things or whatnot. The court just misread the claim. Uh, there is not a direct derivative problem here. And, and if I turn to count seven, really we have a, a similar situation. Count seven was dismissed by the court based on the direct derivative arguments. Count seven was a, um, a claim for intentional breach of fiduciary duty and for breach of contract. The breach of contract being the, the operating agreement provisions that required unanimous consent and the fiduciary duty claims being the, the items I was just discussing and with really some, some extra provisions as well, uh, including excluding Mr. Tanasia from the settlement discussions um, at the mediation. This whole deal was made without him. Had he been part of this, it, it would have been very different. Maybe none of this would ever have happened in terms of this litigation. But, but we have what we have. Count seven is a, a, a claim for breach of intentional, or intentional breach of fiduciary duty and uh, also for breach of contract. The answer brief doesn't want to start with this direct derivative distinction. The answer brief wants to start with collateral estoppel. This collateral estoppel is different than the sort of first flavor I mentioned before. This one concerns the earlier appeal when Mr. Tanasia lost uh, the case against the attorneys in the law firm that were previously involved as defendants. There was an appeal in that case, this court PCA the appeal. We appreciate that the briefing has been uh, provided to this court and collateral estoppel does not work here. The only argument that was made in the law firm appeal regarding this count, count seven, 
was that there couldn't have been a standing problem because downtown St. Pete properties had been dissolved. It's the only argument that was raised in the count seven appeal there. And so as we explained in the briefs as well, we don't have identity of parties. Uh, we don't have identity of issues for the reason I just said. And, and arguably this is not something that should be raised on appeal for the first time in any event. But for all those reasons, there's not collateral estoppel. The other appeal involved the law firm and the claims against the law firm in count seven. These are the claims against Sarai. And then we have the argument that was successful with the trial court there that this was, I say successful, the court granted a motion to dismiss. All it said was granted. So we assume the court did so for the reasons that were in the motion. The reason that was in the motion was that this was a derivative claim, not a direct claim. But for the reasons I said before, that just doesn't work. I, I think at one point the court appreciated that under the operating agreement, there was clearly language that the members could bring a suit for intentional misconduct. And that's exactly what we have here, intentional misconduct. And then beyond that, there are the statutory duties. There's the direct harm to Mr. Tanasia. This is so far removed from the situation where there's just a number of shareholders in a company or a number of members in a limited liability company. And, and somebody just wants to sue because in their capacity as a shareholder, their shares lost value. That is not this at all. All right, sir, that was pretty good. You're right at 16 minutes. Well, I've, I've left one count out. So if I could just speak briefly so that- You may uh, use your time however you like, sir. I appreciate that, Your Honor. I count two, I do not want to leave it out. It was an extremely important claim. This was a breach of fiduciary duty really limited to the withholding of our- not obtaining unanimous consent. Uh, this is the argument with uh, the trial court uh -huh. entering summary judgment based on these four grounds. Three of them were never even argued. They, by my view, are abandoned in the answer brief. Uh, the, the arguments that are made in the answer brief are collateral estoppel, which fails for the reasons I mentioned earlier. These issues were not argued in the prior appeal. They were, that was a, an appeal against the law firm. And then the second is involving the loan documents. They stand on the loan documents argument. But as we explain in the, uh, in the reply brief, uh, the loan documents didn't authorize this. It just would be a complete misreading of them to, to think that they do. Yes, there was a resolution that dealt with making arrangements with the bank, but not breaching your fiduciary duties with the bank and not an agreement that also covered other parties such as FSFA in this case. Uh, the other provisions just don't even begin to cover this. Um, this was, you know, the arguments get made that, well, the bank could have demanded these things. The bank could have stepped into the shoes of downtown St. Pete. Well, but it didn't. It didn't do those things. This was a settlement. The settlement was a breach. And if I can save the balance of my time for rebuttal, I'd appreciate it. You can. Thank you. Mr. Carey. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Michael Carey for Dr. Soraya. I will start with count four as Mr. Coniglero did. Uh, I agree with him that count four arises at a different point in time than the other counts was actually a couple of years earlier at the inception of the relationship. Uh, count four is a claim for fraudulent inducement. Mr. Tanasia claims that he was fraudulently induced to sign some guarantees in favor of lenders. Uh, the alleged inducement is a single act of non-disclosure, and that is an option agreement, which Dr. Sarai and his company, uh, Suburban Federal, had to acquire an additional interest in fuel investment development, which we refer to as FID2 or FID2. And he's only entitled to recover that in the event certain events occurred. The trial court granted summary judgment on count four, and it should be affirmed for two reasons. First, the fatal defect in count four is that the FID2 operating agreement expressly allowed transfers between members without notice to and without consent of the other members. Uh, therefore, there was no duty to disclose something that they were allowed to do without notice and without consent. Likewise, it wouldn't be reasonable uh, to rely upon that not happening if it's expressly allowed. And it's also not material as we argued in our brief. The bottom line here is that Mr. or Dr. Soraya could have gotten the option the day before, the day after, or the day of the signing the loan guarantees. It really didn't matter. That was something that was expressly allowed that Mr. Tanasia agreed to when he signed the FID2 operating agreement. 
We also uh, request that count four be affirmed on the basis of statute of limitations. Tanasia admits he was aware of the transfer uh, of this interest in October or November of 2007, which is more than four years before filing suit. And therefore the statute of limitation clearly applies. I'd like to briefly address Mr. Coniglio's argument that the trial judge uh, ruled, didn't rule on those grounds, he ruled on some other grounds. If you look at the order of the trial court, it is very clear he was granting the motion on the grounds raised. Then he went on and says that one argument Tanasia's counsel made was that count four was supported by a joint and several indemnity agreement. The judge goes on to address that. That is not the sole basis for the court's ruling. It's quite clear he was granting it on the grounds that we raised. It is unfair and unfounded criticism of the trial judge to say that he got that one wrong or he ruled on the wrong grounds. So for those reasons, we would respectfully request that count four be granted. I'd like to next address count two, and that is a breach of fiduciary duty claim. The factual basis for count two is in paragraph 40 of the Second Amendment complaint, and that is the disposal of all DSPP's property and assets. Now, at the outset, I should mention it's a misnomer to say there's a disposal of assets because what happened is the bank repossessed the assets, which they had the absolute right to do under the loan documents that Mr. Tanasia uh, signed and agreed to. Uh, not only uh, did they have the right to do it, but uh, Mr. Uh, Tanasia and Dr. Shraya had the absolute obligation to surrender the collateral upon default. And we're talking about a maturity default here. The note had matured that DSPP owed to the bank. So the trial court properly granted summary judgment. We'd request uh, affirmance on two grounds. One is consent and authorization by Tanasia. Tanasia personally signed the loan documents. The loan documents required the, collateral, the surrender of collateral upon default, which is what happened. Moreover, there was a resolution that Mr. Tanasia agreed to when he signed the final notice of final agreement. That resolution expressly authorized Dr. Soraya to enter in agreements of any nature with the bank and would be binding upon downtown St. Pete properties. Tanasia's counsel on record before the trial court admitted that the loan documents gave the bank the right to do whatever they wanted to do without asking anybody. And that's a direct there, point. Do you have the record site for that handy? Uh, yes, I believe that is 2852. Thank you. Uh, so bottom line here is that uh, Soraya's surrendering of the collateral upon demand was not only authorized, but was required on the loan documents. We'd also request affirmance of count two on the basis of collateral estoppel or issue preclusion. This exact same count was brought against McFarland Ferguson and Mr. Lennon. Uh, matter of fact, at the argument on the summary judgment, I made the argument and they just said me too, literally. And the trial court affirmed, so we're talking, I'm sorry, the trial court granted summary judgment, this court affirmed, uh, so we're talking about the same count, the same identical claim. Uh, we got privies in terms of lawyers. And so we have all requirements of collateral estoppel are present. So we'd respectfully request that count two be affirmed. And finally, we have counts six and seven. And count six is a claim for fraud. And Mr. Canigliaro tries to recast it in his brief. But if you look at it, particularly paragraph 116, the pleader was attempting to plead a claim for fraud. Then you have count seven, which is a claim for damages. Uh, there's no theory identified. I would agree with Mr. Canigliaro. It's probably meant to be a breach of fiduciary duty and breach of contract combined. But in any event, I'd like to address those together because you have a lot of the same factual allegations in both counts. In both counts, the trial court granted a motion to dismiss with prejudice of the Fourth Amendment complaint. And finally, both counts allege derivative claims. So I'd like to, there's two grounds we would urge for affirmance. The first is that both counts allege derivative claims and a direct action, which is not allowed under Florida law. Now, this was a recurring issue before the trial court. Uh, we had two separate 
court orders directing Tanasia to maintain his direct and his derivative claims in separate actions. Uh, the 2013 was the direct case. The 2015 was the derivative case. There was a special litigation committee appointed to hear or to make recommendations with respect to the derivative case. Tanasia failed and refused to comply with the court order. He insisted on including derivative claims in the 2013 direct case, and then count six and seven are prime examples of that. Now, Mr. Tanasia had very experienced trial counsel at the trial court level, and there's no question what they were trying to do was get a second bite at the apple. And as proof that count six and seven are derivative, you, if you look at the derivative case, you will see the third amendment complaint in the derivative case, the one that went to the special litigation committee, there are virtually identical counts to count six and seven of this case. Specifically, count eight of the derivative lawsuit is virtually identical to count six of this case. And count three of the derivative lawsuit is virtually identical to count seven of this case. If you look at the, some of the substantive allegations of count six and seven, you'll see that they allege derivative claims. Uh, both count six and seven allege disposition of DSPP's assets as a basis for the claims being alleged. It's hard to imagine a clear example of a derivative action when you're talking about action involving uh, assets of an entity. Under the De Niro case, which both parties have briefed, uh, a pleader is required to allege a direct claim. They must allege direct harm and also special injury. In connection with the disposition of assets, any alleged injury would be to the entity DSPP. Any alleged injury to Danasia would be indirect or derivative. Count six and seven, another example. Count six and seven both allege the alleged waiver or release of junior lenders from subordination and settlement agreement. That's alleged in both counts. There's no allegation in either count of direct harm or special injury to Danasia arising out of that. There are two reported decisions uh, of this court from 2012 authored by Judge Altenburn dealing with these exact same subordination settlement agreements. And that those cases held that the subordination, subordination standstill agreements did not preclude the junior lenders, Abed and Horizon from suing or obtaining judgment against the guarantors, including, Dr., including Mr. Tanasia. They only affected the priority of collection rights between the senior and junior lenders. They did not affect or increase any liability of Tanasia. And that is why Tanasia, in his pleadings, can't identify any special injury or direct harm to himself because there is none. Now, Mr. Conigo has argued today, and he argued in his brief, that counts six and seven fit within an exception to, to De Niro for statutory or contractual claims. We would respectfully disagree. First of all, there are no statutory claims pled. Second, to fit within the exception to De Niro for contractual claims, those contractual claims must arise out of an operating agreement which contains a provision stating that members shall be directly liable to each other for breaches of the terms of the operating agreement. That's right out of De Niro. And if you look at the operating agreement in this case, the DSPP agreement has no such provision. There's no such provision stating what, that members shall be directly liable to each other. If you look at the operating agreement language that is quoted in De Niro from that case, much stronger than the language in the DSPP operating agreement. The court in De Niro held did not fit within the exception. So we'd respectfully request that counts six and seven be dismissed based upon the fact that they improperly assert derivative claims. The second grounds for affirmance for counts six and seven is collateral estoppel or issue preclusion. We have three different reasons. First, in count seven, count seven was an action brought uh, as a derivative action, both against Soraya, but also against McFarland Ferguson and Patrick Lennon. That dismissal was affirmed by the court, this court on appeal. 
McFarland, Ferguson, and Leonard are privies of Soraya as, their, as his attorneys. Therefore, you have identity of, of parties for purpose of collateral estoppel, and all other elements of collateral estoppel are present. There are also allegations in both counts concerning waiver and release of subordination standstill agreements, as I mentioned before. The trial court granted summary judgment on count nine, which was specifically on that. It was not appealed, therefore we have a final decision. Therefore, Tanasia should be collaterally stopped from asserting the claims he's asserting here, which are really at the pleading stage regarding the waiver and release of subordination standstill agreement, but the court's granted summary judgment saying there's no basis for a claim. And finally, we have in count six and seven, we have the allegations of disposition of DSPP assets. The trial court granted summary judgment on count two. Uh, we'd respectfully uh, suggest that uh, this court should affirm that it's on appeal before you. And if affirmed, that should collaterally stop Tanasia from asserting further claims regarding the disposition of DSPP's assets. Finally, I'd like to address a few of the replies which Tanasia made regarding collateral estoppel. First, he argues that collateral estoppel is an affirmative defense which must be res, which must be pled. The flaw with that argument is that the final judgment and the appellate decisions that we are relying upon that form the basis of collateral estoppel in this case were not entered until after the dismissal of count six and seven. Therefore, they could not have been pled as affirmative defenses. Second, Mr. Tanasia argues that collateral estoppel requires a prior suit, uh, not the same action. As a general rule, there usually is a prior suit and the case, that's what the courts are referring to. But collateral estoppel is also known as estoppel by judgment. A judgment can constitute collateral estoppel, whether it is in the normal case where you have multiple lawsuits or in the fairly unusual case we hear where you have separate judgments all arising out of the same action. The last thing that Mr. Tanisha argues in reply is there's no identity of issues. And he specifically refers to count six uh, which Mr. Canigliaro has tried to recast as a claim for constructive fraud, which has been pled as a claim for fraud, and count nine, which he claims is a claim for breach of contract. However, if you break that down, you will see that count six, as I mentioned, is pled as a fraud count. Count nine was initially pled as fraud and breach of contract. The trial court dismissed the fraud portion of that complaint with prejudice. It was never appealed. Summary judgment was granted on the breach of contract. So we do have an identity of issues between them, between the two counts. So for all those reasons, we respectfully request that all four counts at issue in this, uh, in this appeal be affirmed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Rebuttal. Do I, do I, thank you, Your Honor. You have, you have like four minutes left, which is, I appreciate I think what you that. Yeah. I, I understand that there's a, a sort of a, a philosophy in practice. If, if you just throw enough at a court, it becomes uh, hard for the court to resist at some point, just throwing up its hands. And this is a case where a lot has been basically placed in the court's hands. We would encourage the court to try to work through these because in the end, and I guess maybe I'll start with this as a big picture point. In the end, it should be as simple as this. Mr. Tanasia was a member of an LLC. The managing member sold him out, not just by turning over the documents. So your honor raised a point about that earlier. And, and had, had all that happened was the LLC turned over the loan documents because the bank demanded them or had the bank said, we're going to step into your shoes, LLC, and we're going to vote, and we're going to vote and have these outcomes, then I'd say we wouldn't be here today. That's not what happened. What happened was the documents were held back until there was a grand settlement. And that grand settlement had all these parts, and the parts included waiving the standstill agreements, releasing everyone involved, except Mr. Tanasia, and basically creating these kickback situations where Dr. Soraya was going to get kickbacks when Abed and Paragon recovered from Mr. Tanasia. That alone must be actionable somewhere in the law. So if we bring our claims, they say, oh, these are really derivative claims. What happened with the derivative claims? No, oh, these really is no claim here. That's what happened with the derivative claims. And so how, is, how could there not be an action? 
for something so uh, improper as to, as managing member, wearing your hat, to release those standstill agreements. Council just argued, well, the standstill agreements really didn't stop collection. Uh, well, it, 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 they adjusted priority and there was no reason for Abbott and Paragon to go forward knowing they weren't going to get the money. And so that's how that played out. It, it, the court at this point should be looking at the actual events. What did the bank do or not do? What did Abed and Paragon do or not do? All these things should be taken the light most favorable to Mr. Tanasia. And under these circumstances, I respectfully suggest there must be a claim. This is, you can't as the manager make these steps and basically betray your only member, your only other member and have no claim as a matter of law against you. There's just no claim. That, that can't be. These claims for breach of fiduciary duty absolutely have merit. And, and now I'll go through a little bit more detail at this point. First, regarding uh, count four, uh, council mentioned, well, the, the transfer provision allowed for transfer, so there couldn't have been fraudulent inducement. The, the trial court never said that, and it's just wrong. Uh, first of all, the, the, the option agreement here was also with Soraya. And so there wasn't an opportunity under the, the transfer provision to transfer it to Dr. Soraya. And second of all, the point is this fact, the agreement here, this option agreement was withheld. Had it not been withheld, these things wouldn't have happened. And we can't look to later events to say, well, it doesn't matter. I know I'm about out of time. Uh, with regard to the other claims, uh, I want to emphasize that the claims were broadly pled. Um, and, and they involved different arguments against different defendants within the claims. The other claims against the law firm were not the claims that were against Dr. Soraya. And with regard to the agreement, counsel said that there is nothing in the operating agreement. I want to direct the court, page 2295 of the record, section 4.4 of the operating agreement makes absolutely clear that these could be direct claims. Such persons shall be liable for their own willful misconduct in the performance of their obligations. The prior sentence says, the manager shall not be liable to any member for good faith actions. That allowed these claims to be brought directly. These are not derivative claims. If the court has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I have them. one question. I'm doing something I always try not to do, which is ask it when time's up. But uh, I feel like I, I read somewhere in your brief that these counts at issue, even though this is like the fourth amended complaint, these counts hadn't been amended previously. This is the first time they were, like at least the motion to dismiss was directed to one of these counts. Is it, that right? It, in essence, yes, Your Honor. There, there was a strange set of circumstances. In, in was how there this... any request to, for leave to amend or any, is there anything, were you trying to get at that when you, when you mentioned that fact in your brief? No, I think what we were trying to do was was to explain that um, that sometimes there's a, a sense of momentum, like you've tried and you've tried and you've tried, and, and that's just not what happened. And that's not the case with these counts. Okay, I appreciate that. And I want to thank you both for these well-presented arguments. This is a thorny case factually, and, and I personally appreciate the efforts that you made during oral argument and in your briefing to help us digest all this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Our next case on this morning's docket uh, is our last case. Uh, Moran and Andrews versus the Value Adjustments, Adjustment Board for Pinellas County. Good morning, Your Honors. Morning. Morning, Your Honor. Rinky Good morning. Morning. All right. Ms. Rodas? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. All right. We're ready when you are. You want to save five minutes for rebuttal? Yes, ma'am. Got it. May it please the court. My name is Kristen Rodas, and I represent the appellants in this case. These are taxpayers who had come before the Value Adjustment Board after they were trying to appeal their decision or the decision of the property appraiser to allow that part of their property to be exempt under the agricultural statute. They came before the Value Adjustment Board and because we are a population of over 75,000 people, 
To have an evidentiary hearing, this would require that the magistrate, a special magistrate, be appointed to hear the evidence that was presented. In this case, that's exactly what happened. The taxpayers came before the uh, special magistrate. They presented their evidence. The property appraiser's office had their attorney who presented their evidence. And ultimately, the special magistrate made a decision that the taxpayers should be granted, excuse me, should be granted this exemption. And in doing so, she wrote a written finding, her written findings that had the conclusions of law and the reasons for um, making her ultimate decision to overturn the property appraiser's decision. Then it became a point where the property, or excuse me, the value adjustment board had the opportunity per the legislative, or excuse me, per the administrative rules that would permit them to decide whether or not the magistrate had followed all of the requirements And if she had followed all those requirements, there are three specifically, if she had followed all of them, then they shall, under this rule, adopt the findings from the magistrate. And ultimately, that was a decision that was put before the Value Adjustment Board. In doing so, they had present at the time someone, a attorney from the city of Largo, and then also the attorney that was representing the property appraiser. They came before the Value Adjustment Board and started explaining their version of the facts that were presented and their version of why the special magistrate was incorrect in her decision. And in doing so, it made essentially this meeting turn into a secondary evidentiary hearing. Well, can I interrupt you a second? Wasn't the recommendation of the first magistrate an interim recommendation subject to being adopted by the VAB? Yes, yes, Your Honor. It is absolutely so, meant to... Well, the, the thing I'm, uh, that concerns me is the phrase interim means it's not final. And your clients chose not to attend the meeting when it would have been adopted, assuming it was adopted in their favor. Is that true or false? It is true, Your Honor. They're, they weren't present at that meeting, but I would tell the okay, court... But- but let me go to the next The next question is, and the Value Adjustment Board was very sensitive to the fact that they weren't present, so they didn't really have a full-fledged hearing, but they scheduled for something in the future and decided to appoint another magistrate to take more evidence and have another hearing, and that's following up with the person from Largo that showed up to protest this. And, and your, your honor is correct on the facts on how that occurs, but the problem becomes the mechanisms that they have to get to the next step were not followed. So what we've got is specifically in the administrative order to, to make a determination on whether they're going to adopt this um, recommendation, they have to go through three steps. Was the magistrate a qualified magistrate? I don't think there's any question that, that based off of the both the hearing transcripts. Yeah, but we, but in other words, Apparently, there was a dispute as to what was presented to the magistrate if the decision was made upon all the facts. I guess this is a a bird uh, operation, people raising birds in a residential neighborhood, and these facts apparently were not shed the way the person from Largo tried to intervene and explain it, and and that caused them to say, well, maybe we missed the boat here. I mean, there wasn't the remedy to just follow... uh, a lawsuit in circuit court for your clients, not to file an an, an appeal with sort of this, uh, you have to sign this, we follow the rules, now you got to follow the rules. Well, and that's, I think the point is that the value adjustment board must first follow the rules and their rules, the first portion of their rules is not discretionary. The first portion of their rules is mandatory if they find that all three of the factors were presented, all three of the requirements. did, Did they make that finding? And they did. And in fact, when you How did they the, make that finding? Explain that to me, please. And through the through the conversations in this basically informal okay. meeting, what you can hear from both the Miss Parwani, who was the attorney for the value adjustment board. So, so, so you're saying the discussion became formal findings verbally somehow? Not that it became formal findings, Your Honor, but what is evident from this testimony or from the, excuse me, from the transcript was that the parties, um, the individuals who were in this meeting all were discussing what was happening in the in the meeting and how the interpretation of the recommendations came down 
their only questions and their only concerns appeared to be factual based. Their concerns were not whether or not the magistrate's order had actually complied with the administrative rule. It was factually, we just don't agree with what her decision was. And that's not the place that was not their circumstance. That wasn't what they were supposed to be doing. They were supposed to be making a determination on whether she had actually complied with the administrative rule. Now, let's say they had gone through and made the decision. We didn't agree that she actually followed through with the, with the requirements under the administrative rule. That's what triggers the additional hearings because then they can't just leave it hanging. They have to send it off to what would either be back to the magistrate or to an additional hearing to finish up and make sure that all three requirements had actually been met before they can act, they can adopt the findings. But let's assume here, that we're let's assume that we are sympathetic to that issue and they shouldn't have had another magistrate. I want to go back to Judge Vellante's uh, <clears throat> question with regard to filing this in circuit court versus where we find ourselves today in a mandamus action when basically the car's already left the garage. What, can you describe for us what you foresee if we were to agree with you how this would work um, from a mandamus standpoint? Your Honor, for the mandamus, what we would be asking for the court to do is to recognize obviously that this the mechanisms were not followed and to force this agency to follow their own recommendations and what we've, or follow, excuse me, follow their own mandates in the sense that they are required to evaluate this in which they did. And if the court agrees that they made a determination that all of the requirements were met for them to adopt this, then they should have adopted the actual uh, recommendations from the magistrate. And that would have then in turn allowed the property appraiser to do what they should have done. If they disagreed with the circumstances, they disagreed with the um, evaluation of the magistrate, they had a right to an appeal. But it would be to send this back and say, no, you know, the value adjustment board, you had already made a conclusion that she did, the uh, magistrate did comply with the administrative rules, she had done nothing wrong other than you found well, let, let me Let me make sure I understand. I think what Judge Stargell was saying is the value adjustment board has already done their thing. Now, obviously you disagree with that, but it's not like you're filing a mandamus before they've acted. They've already acted. They've done their thing. You, your remedy would be to file the appeal in circuit court and that wasn't done. I don't well, see and, how we do a mandamus at this point. Yeah, and the mandamus, just for the procedural portion of it, the mandamus was actually filed before the final decision that was made by the Value Adjustment Board. Um, so that was something that happened first in time. Well, there was no injunction. They couldn't, there's no, there's no prohibition against them changing the results, whether you liked it or not. Well, and I would disagree in the sense of there is a prohibition because they didn't follow what was required of them. And, okay, and mandamus well would you're, allow- You're kind of arguing the merits of a potential appeal that you didn't take the appeal. And, so and I think the issue becomes with an appeal is that we are then appealing what would be the secondary or the, the second magistrate's decision because what they ended up doing was having a first evidentiary hearing well, and then a second mandamus. evidentiary we're, we're here on a mandamus today, not on an appeal. Correct. something that never occurred. And, and I believe with the circumstances of a mandamus, it is to go back and say that an administrative agency, you didn't follow the rules. And under the... All right. We disagree on that point, but okay. I'll uh, let you finish your argument. I apologize for interrupting. Oh, no, Your Honor, that's fine. Um, and understanding in the, the idea of when there is an administrative agency and they were to go through these procedures their first procedure in this would be to make sure or to, to see if these evaluations or excuse me, these administrative rules were followed. Once but these were arguments followed, were never made at the at the meeting that your clients didn't attend. I mean, maybe they were valid arguments, but and they should have been presented, but it seems to me they waived their right to go there and complain about all the things you're saying now by not showing up. And, and I guess the, the, the response to that would be they would expect that the value adjustment board was going to follow their own, their own requirements. They were to follow the administrative well, rules. You and, would expect, but it doesn't always happen, right? And that's why we're here is because that's not what All happened. Right. 
Um, but aren't we also here though because uh, they did not get an injunction if they had asked for the mandamus and an injunction that would have frozen things in time but they didn't they went ahead and acted so at that point i'm still not clear why this you shouldn't have appealed it to circuit court and what effect uh, us granting the mandamus at this point is going to have well and i when we go to the circuit court, it then becomes a de novo review. And I believe that that issue becomes, now we're looking at this with fresh eyes. And when we're in a circumstance like this, where we have from the transcripts, a very clear record that they knew, and we're very clear on the fact that the written recommendation did comply with the administrative rules, that that would then require these taxpayers to go through yet again another review of a decision that should have never even gotten to that point. We have Ms. Parwani herself telling the Value Adjustment Board this, this recommendation followed all the rules. It was is exactly what it was supposed to be. They just disagreed with it factually. And so we, we've now become and we make these taxpayers go through not one evidentiary hearing, a second evidentiary hearing, and then what would be essentially a de novo review, a start over or to restart the whole evaluation all over again. When Miss Rose, I, I hear your argument and I'm sympathetic to it, actually. I mean, I think the the second magistrate, second bite of the apple is an important issue. It's the process that got me kind of hung up as I was going through the briefs that as to what you're really what remedy you're going to get here as opposed to other steps that you could have taken in the process. And I do understand the court's concern under that matter in the sense of the appeal itself becoming from the circuit court. But I guess the question then becomes for the court is what would be the value of going to a de novo appeal when the argument from the value adjustment board is going to essentially say, well, we've gone through a second evidentiary hearing, the court should evaluate the second evidentiary hearing and this new information that was brought up versus this is the only information that should be evaluated by any court or by any, anybody in the, in the process of this, including the value adjustment board was the first magistrate as they recognized that's exactly what was um, the, that was a valid written opinion, a valid written, um, or excuse me, complied with the administrative rules. So I, I, I do understand the court's plight in this. It's just under the circumstances, what we believe is the mandamus would allow this, this court to come back and tell the administrative, this administrative agency, their job was to comply. And by a, the record itself, it presents it with the ability to do so. Now, I believe the, what we have right now is by allowing the value adjustment board to do this procedure is we open the door to what one of the, one of the people in this hearing actually mentioned to Ms. Parwani. Well, what happens if the second um, magistrate comes back and says, you know, we agree with the first magistrate. Do we get to go to a third? Do we get to go to a fourth? Are, are we going to be shopping for magistrates until we finally get one who tells us what we want to hear? And that, their decision to be able to go to the second magistrate and not be required to follow their own administrative rules puts us in this position. Um, I brought forth in the um, in our initial brief Solomon, and Solomon was from the Florida Supreme Court, and it was about registration board, where a similar circumstance where they had essentially check boxes. These are the things that we would have to look for to make a decision on whether or not this person would be grandfathered in. And it was a checklist and there was no discretion after that checklist because it went through, once they went through and they checked all the boxes, there was no discretion. They had to allow that person to be grandfathered in. That's the circumstances that we were in here where each one of the checklists were met. You heard from the transcripts that everybody agreed that they were met. It's just factually, they disagreed with the ultimate decision. And because those were all met, we're asking the court to go back and tell the value adjustment board that it's their job to comply with the administrative rules. And by complying with the administrative rules, they would have to have approved um, the magistrate's decision and 
that would be that would be their findings. And then again, this would set this circumstance where if the property appraisers disagreed, they would have the ability to go forward and ask for the appeal if needed. Um, Thank you. You have five minutes left for rebuttal. Now you can use your time however you like. You, I'm sorry. Wanna, you have five minutes left. If you want to continue, you may, but I just wanted to let you know. Yeah, no, ma'am. Thank you. That would be my conclusion of my argument and I will rest on the rest or leave the rest for the um, rebuttal. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Parwani? May it please the court. My name is Rinki Parwani and I'm counsel for the Value Adjustment Board of Pinellas County. Thank you, your honors, for your time today. The heart of your decision today goes to the root of the day-to-day -day work that you do. It's about the discretion you have to put your name on a final decision and determine its contents. Just as a law clerk may prepare a final order for your review and signature, today you were deciding whether you as a judge are required to sign off on that clerk's draft. Are you a rubber stamp? We are focused today on a petition from Sir Sharari and a writ of mandamus. And just as a preliminary matter, Section 194.171 is a jurisdictional statute which states no action to contest a tax assessment may be brought without complying with this statute. And the courts shall lose jurisdiction and must dismiss this case unless all taxes on a property assessed in years after the action is brought are paid before they become delinquent. The statute also states that no action shall be brought to contest a tax assessment after 60 days from the final action by the Value Adjustment Board. The petitioner at a very minimum has not pled or provided with receipts in the appendix with the complaint to meet the jurisdictional requirements and this court may dismiss the matter on its face. The petitioner may argue that the jurisdictional requirements are not applicable because this case pertains to a writ of mandamus and a petition for certiorari. But the statute is clear, no action may be brought and the court has no jurisdiction of this case at this time. But moving forward, um, secondly, this decision is about a writ of certiorari and whether the trial court has complied with the procedural due process requirements and applied the correct law. And if the court chooses Mooses to forward today, the petitioners are asking for a writ of mandamus to issue a final order, which the Value Adjustment Board has already issued their final action. So unfortunately, there's nothing to mandate. Um, I think this is particularly telling, um, Your Honors, if you review the recommendation from the first magistrate to the second magistrate. The first magistrate's decision was four pages long. The second magistrate's decision was 20 pages long. This alone shows the board's decision was justified in that the first magistrate did not follow the requirements in their opinion. I mean, what we're talking about today, Your Honors, is that um, this is really the board's discretionary authority and the statutes make that very clear. First of all, the statutes state if the board determines that the recommendations meet the requirements of three separate statutes, 194.301, 194. Let me stop you right there though on, on your issue of four pages versus 20 pages. These are evidentiary matters, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So if you send it back to a second court, once you know what a first court has ordered, you're basically kind of arguing the postage, the old postage meter, people don't even know what those are anymore, <laughs> whatever weighs more. But <laughs> for a second bite at the apple and you know, okay, they didn't consider all of these or we didn't present this evidence. What do you say to that argument that what about a third time or a fourth time? How many times do you go back and ask for additional hearings? Well, I, I think that's where, I mean, I, I don't think the value adjustment board sits there and tries to make sure that these recommendations get denied, Your Honor. I think the focus would have been, and I had told counsel at the time, I said, if you really believe that, that the first magistrate's decision is, you know, solid in stone, you have the right to appeal it immediately. You don't have to wait for my board to decide. You can stop this board process, file a appeal, and, and just use the magistrate's opinion you have. Um, so there are definitely um, processes to that. 
there's also timing requirements, Your Honor. Um, the Value Adjustment Board has to make their decisions, I believe, by April, April 1st or June 1st. I can't remember. I think it's June 1st of every year. So at some point, the process has to stop and a decision has to be made. I think here what's very telling to me, Your Honor, is that if you really look through the transcript of the board's decisions, and they really walk through the process very carefully on whether this met the requirements of these sections. And I think if you compare that to what the decisions were from the two magistrates, the board had the discretion to determine that that first recommendation didn't really walk through all the requirements to make it clear that, um, that it was you know, the reasons for upholding and overturning the determination. And even if you look through the transcript as well, I say the same thing, this can go either way based on the recommendation as written. It's very hard to understand how the first magistrate came to that decision through that process. It, you well, know, and and I, I agree with you when you talk about the process and it's a very finite process, there's uh, definite terms that have to be met time periods, but just to the point of what the board can do and what the magistrate hears, if someone doesn't present evidence to it and they rule there was no evidence to this factor um, going forward, a board, you know, how many times is it your position that they can go and say, well, I, we don't agree with where they came down on this issue when there wasn't evidence, whether there's a trial judge or a magistrate, uh, if you've got a burden to prove and you don't prove it, how many times can you send it back to a, a finder of fact to come up with the evidence that you like? Well, my experience um, supervising the magistrates over six counties and also being a magistrate myself, I've never seen it go back more than twice ever in 10 years. So I don't know that there's a limit. I haven't found one in the statute. How many of those times did uh, it come back the same all three times? I mean, that's just rhetorical. I'm sorry. I just, well, you know, there's, I, there's I, only I, a certain you know, number of times you have to send it back until you get an answer that you want. Well, it, sometimes they come back the same. Sometimes they come back different, Your Honor. Um, I think if you read the transcript, I was even um, in, in, I think, another county. I think and if you read the transcript from the hearing that I provided um, my advice to the board, that I advise them. It can come back different. It can come back the same. It's just a matter of what the petitioner presents at the hearing. And, um, you know, my advice to the petitioner's counsel was make sure you provide the transcript from the previous hearing because, you know, that's going to be important to how that magistrate decides. They can hear everything from the first magistrate. You can provide that to them. You can continue. Okay. Thank you. Um, so basically, the statutes provide several places where it's clear the board has discretionary authority. One um, is um, the, if the board determines it meets the requirements of those three statutes. Secondly, um, 12, um, th there's also a section that says the board shall not adopt any recommendation decision that's not in compliance. So it doesn't, it's not a rubber stamp that they have to, they have to make sure, and, and it's, the transcript is pretty lengthy. I didn't quote that in my brief, Your Honor, but it was probably 12 to 30 pages of the board just deciding whether it was in compliance with these statutes. And more importantly, this is the board's decision. They have to, they can rely on legal counsel, but they're, you know, the whole purpose of it is to give the petitioners the opportunity. I mean, they basically get, two hearings, their initial evidentiary hearing, and then a second hearing, which allows them to go before the board and you know go forth and make sure that their recommendation gets approved or denied. And, and that recommendation has to be considered by the board. It's not that they have to accept it under 194.0342. And also 194.035 subsection one also explains the discretionary authority um, that the board may act upon the recommended decisions without further hearing, meaning there can be a further hearing. So the 20 pages or more in the transcript was the board doing that, asking in their discretion. And I don't think that that would be an appropriate precedent to set going forward to say, 
you have to accept this recommendation no matter what. Um, and Your Honor, I'm just going to go back. I believe um, your question was, how long can this go on? It's my understanding in another county in Broward, and I don't know if it came Broward County, that sometimes these, um, if the year hasn't closed out for the value adjustment board, I do know, and just to be frank, that that county had um, gone on for a couple of years on decisions rather than keeping it within um, a certain time frame. So the statutory authority to complete the recommendations by June 1st, I think was just entered recently to prevent that ongoing process that you're talking about. Um, the other point that I'd like to address, Your Honor, is the writ of mandamus and the standards there. Um, the petitioner has to show a clear right to relief, and I don't think that that has happened here. There's many points in the process that the petitioner had the right to appeal, and um, I think here we have a, it's not a ministerial duty as shown by those statutory requirements. Um, there has to be any, no, no discretion whatsoever in this process, and I don't think that we can find that within the um, rules and statutes as written. And the petitioner did have other um, remedies. It hasn't, they haven't been exhausted. In fact, one of the cases that the petitioner cited was Halifax versus Dayton, which actually says you can't go back to the same administrative body for an appeal. So it's consistent in that the petitioner would have to file an appeal with the trial court under that um, rule. And also Dante versus Ryan, of course, that um, you have to file all your um, remedies, administrative um, remedies before filing the writ. Um, I, I think what's important here also is the value adjustment board really went out of the way to allow the petitioner an opportunity to address the issues before even overturning their case. Um, the petitioners weren't present at the, um, the hearing where the VAB considered it um, in the transcript. did get notice, so notice is not an issue. No, 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 no. Everybody gets notice, Your Honor. What happens is once the final or the interim recommendation is written, um, with on the bottom of that, there'll be a notice um, of the date and the time of the meeting. If that meeting hasn't been set for the value adjustment board, then that is um, they are instructed to look at the either the website or the publication to find that date. And um, so they become aware through the statutory process of the proper notice of that meeting, sir. So um, the petitioners were noticed, but, I mean, they received their recommendation. So that would have had the notice on it um, to appear that day. And it is typical and probably more so typical at these hearings um, that if a petition is granted, those petitioners tend to show to make sure that those recommendations are granted by the board that day and there's no unexpected works. But I think I really admired my board for taking the time to say, you know, the petitioners aren't here today, we could just overturn it based on the facts we have in the recommendation from Ms. Rutland, and they didn't do it. They wanted the petitioner to have their say and have the opportunity to address any concerns. And particularly, I think it's important they follow the rules and that some of the evidentiary issues that were brought up were sent to a magistrate rather than having the board make those findings. More importantly, I think as we sit here today, uh, Ms. Andrews is not a taxpayer entitled to relief at this point. So even if, even if you gave everything um, going forward, Ms. Andrews no longer is on the property, the birds are no longer, I'm assuming not there, if she's not there, and Mr. Moran is not somebody who can claim um, the agricultural exemption without Miss Andrews um, bird farm uh, bird I, I don't know what the correct um, word for it is but having the birds on the property um, so regardless um, of you know whatever the city of Largo said or anybody else today we're sitting here without an agricultural exemption and more and also just to have a better understanding of the process your honors moving forward let's say the petitioners were granted their agricultural exemption. That doesn't mean one, the property appraiser couldn't have appealed it. Two, they couldn't have, they could have, you know, rejected their exemption the next year. Um, so I think what also is important here, the board really took into account that we want to, we don't want this 
petitioner taxpayer to be burdened by coming back year after year or fighting this. Let's try to take care of this by getting everything addressed in an informal hearing for our petitioners. I want to thank you for your time today and I'm open to any questions. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, rebuttal? Yes, your honors, thank you. It seems as though the court is mainly concerned at least in part about the mandamus issue and mandamus relief is appropriate when there's an administrative agency such as the VBA, uh, VAB, excuse me, that fails to perform a ministerial duty um, and the complainant has no other um, remedy available to, to him or her. Under the circumstances with how this value adjustment board performed its ministerial duties, it did so inappropriately. And the bottom line is, is they come into this hearing and it is, I think, abundantly clear from the transcript that their issues were factually based. There was nothing that was brought up at all about whether or not the magistrate had actually complied with any of these rules, any of the statutes. There was nothing brought up about how um, she didn't um, provide an explanation as to why she overturned the decision. It was all factually based. And at the point in time that you filed your action, they had not ruled, correct? They had not done their final ruling, correct. But then they did. They did after, yes. So what you're really asking us is not to make them rule, but to make them rule in your favor. So that's what's where I'm getting caught up there is that that should have been an appeal. You disagreed with their ruling, not that you need us to tell them to perform a ministerial act because they eventually did that. Why wouldn't it have become moot at the point in time that they ruled and that you should have then filed uh, some other uh, action? And I think that it comes down to what their ministerial duties were. And under the ministerial duties, there was the discretion only came after they made a conclusion that the magistrate had not complied with the three statutes that were mentioned. So their it, discretion only comes after that point. Their original ministerial duty comes down to, did they check each one of those boxes? And what we heard from the transcript was, that's exactly what happened. They agreed on every one of those requirements. They just disagreed with the facts. And so if they've agreed with all of that, they don't have the discretion if they shall adopt the recommendations. I'm going to try Judge Startle's question a different way. Couldn't, at the point they rendered the decision, you have appealed from that and, and your basis, one of your bases for challenging it would be that they did not follow the proper procedure initially. And I, so you I, would still get to raise that issue, but you would raise it in a challenge to the final decision. And I believe the issue becomes a... As opposed no, to now where you want us to re unwind everything with a mandamus. Yes. And, and I understand where the court's concern is. I think the issue with the direct appeal because of the statutes and the, and the case law that supports the idea that they can appeal this decision is that it becomes a de novo review. And it becomes a scenario where they have a full, uh, basically a full bite at the apple to, to do, to make their arguments again before the court, rather than what they should have done, which was make the decision at the very beginning, once they've concluded. Yeah, well, you get to make the argument that they should have done that at the very beginning. I, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't hear what you said. Well, I, I mean, the, 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 if anything, a de novo review would benefit you on appeal. And, and you get to argue, hey, when you did the initial uh, proceeding, you 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 didn't check the boxes you were supposed to check. You didn't you didn't you can raise the issue you're now raising in the mandamus. And, and in part of that is that it also allows the value adjustment board to then bring in what was now a second evidentiary hearing, where now we have uh, right. But your argument is we don't get to that because they didn't do this right initially. And I think that's what the value, or that's what the purpose of the mandamus was, is to cut it off at that point in time and say to the court, you know, there was these requirements and 
because they didn't follow through with the requirements, we don't even get to the next point of it. Um, yeah, but they did. And they did under the idea that they knew that they weren't supposed to. And I think that's kind of the, the problem with the industry. Yeah, no, I understand. I understand what you're saying. And I understand the dilemma here. Um, Thank so you. Your honors, I, I would just tell the court that I think under the circumstances, we've really created a circumstance um, in the administrative rules that if this was permitted, we have exactly what I think your honors were concerned about, which is multiple bites of the apple where they just frankly don't hear what they wanna hear. And then ultimately they keep getting more magistrates until they get an answer. I think it is telling to the court that there's only, the only circumstances the VBA or the VAB has had is they've had one magistrate and then they send it to another magistrate and then they get what they want. And that's not what the purpose of the value adjustment board is. They're supposed to be help, helpful and neutral to these taxpayers to be able to make a appeal to someone who isn't going to simply fall on the sword of the city or the property appraisers um, whenever they come in and complain about the circumstances that they got, you know, when the magistrate disagrees with their stance. So I'd okay. be asking- um, Go ahead, wrap up, please. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. I was, I'd be asking the court to recognize that this was an administrial duty um, that was not complied with and per the this transcripts, that they had recognized that they had the magistrate had done everything they were supposed to have done and order that the final decision should have been um, to approve that um, special magistrate's order. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, that concludes our session uh, today. So court will be adjourned. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Your Honor.